They have come to the Peloponnese from Asia Minor, from the Black Sea, from North Africa, from Cyprus and Greater Greece. 40,000 sports enthusiasts want to see top-class performances and to pay homage to their gods. The heat shimmers over the arena. One spectator has died of thirst. Word has got out of a bribery scandal. A politician is basking in the adulation of the crowd. That description could well have been found in any chronicle of the games that had taken place in Olympia since 776 BC. Our guarantor of this is Pausanias, a historian who recorded the architectural splendor that was still evident and what was to be said about gods and heroes. Pausanias wrote his classical guidebook in AD 200. By then the games were nearly a thousand years old and disaster was about to strike. First the earth trembled, then the Alpheus and Cladeus rivers, much celebrated in song and verse, rose. What the thunderous earthquake had left standing was covered by masses of mud. Four meters below the surface, sacred halls slumbered along with statues of victors, training camps, treasure houses, an exclusive hostel and grand ideals. Then in the 18th century they were rediscovered. A hundred years later, German archaeologists embarked on systematic excavation work and Pausanias' lengthy descriptions gained fresh prestige. They served as construction plans, as instructions on how to assemble the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. German experts are still digging and researching here today, classifying fragments and identifying epochs from an entire millennium. All the major treasures have long since been excavated, so the archaeologists are absolutely delighted when, after all, they make a substantial discovery, like the base of a Byzantine votive offering, which was found not so long ago. It even bore an inscription, a foot, 2,500 years old. The most outstanding performances in running came from Leonidas of Rhodes. He lost none of his speed over four Olympiads, recording 12 victories. It all began with a 200-meter sprint in the stadium. The 18th Olympic Games saw the addition of wrestling and the pentathlon, while horse racing was introduced for the Games of the 25th Olympiad. At some time or other, the one-day event became a five-day festival. For the Greeks, in the Argon, or contest, only victory itself mattered. There was no prestige whatsoever in coming second or third. It was all about winning, about being crowned with a wreath made from the leaves of the wild olive tree and seeing your own statue erected. Pausanias read the inscriptions on the plinths like Olympic yearbooks. To modern ears, they sound like heroic legends. Mylon from Croton recorded six victories in wrestling. It is said that he carried his statue into the Altis himself. On the last day of the Games, the Olympic champions were honored in the Temple of Zeus. Sport and cult, contest and consecration, just like the example set by the gods. Legend has it that Zeus defeated his father, Kronos, with his fists, while Apollo triumphed over Ares in the pentathlon and over Hermes in a foot race. 
the mythical tales of how the games were born and also the call for peace were immortalized in the friezes in the Temple of Zeus. After their wars with the Persians, the Greeks, who were always at loggerheads with one another, realized that Olympia had to become a symbol of internal harmony with an oracle and court of arbitration. Do you barbarians not have enemies enough? Aristophanes admonished in 411 BC that you need to exterminate Hellenic cities and men. Soon after, the Temple of Zeus was erected, funded from the spoils of the Eleans and decorated with the booty from a Roman commander. And that in the name of peace. Anyone picking their way through this stony wasteland today will sense the might of the titans who once competed here. But they will have no impression of the former magnificence of the temple. 20 meters high and 70 meters long, it was the most outstanding example of early classical architecture. German archaeologists and masons are rebuilding a column in an attempt to give an indication of that splendor because at this end of the stadium, there once stood a huge statue of Zeus, made of gold and ivory, a staggering classical wonder of the world. It was here that Phidias, the sculptor who created the statue, had his workshop. Later, it was turned into a Byzantine church. When the statue was completed, Phidias prayed to God, asking for a sign that he was pleased with his work. At once, a bolt of lightning struck the ground. Every free-born Greek could enter for the games, provided he was born in wedlock and had not committed any crime. But soon, the olive branch was only one aspect of Olympic victory. Back home, champions could expect tax exemption, financial allowances and gifts. The road to professional athletics began in Olympia. As far as female spectators were concerned, it is said that only virgins were allowed to watch the contests. Married women were barred on pain of death. After the death of her husband, Calopatia dressed as a sports instructor and took her son to compete. When he triumphed, she leapt over the enclosure and exposed herself. She was not punished. However, a law was passed requiring all sports instructors appearing for a contest to do so naked. The women had their own contests in the form of the Games of Hera. Here too, victors were crowned with an olive branch and were allowed to consecrate their statue in the Temple of Hera. Olympia had become the stone testimony to an ideal, a consummate work of art. Here too, trumpeters competed against one another and theater performances took place. The common people were entertained by jugglers. There were stalls for them to walk around and they stayed in tent villages. Olympia was a public festival characterized by noise, stench and a water shortage. The athletes enjoyed more luxurious accommodation. Everything had been thought of. There were training areas, baths, and probably a library too, as well as lecture theatres where experts in rhetoric taught their skills. Training schedules, hygiene regulations, everything was strictly controlled. So was the athlete's diet. Barley bread, wheat mush, and dried fruit for track and field athletes. However, it is said that the legendary wrestler Mylon ate 20 pounds of meat and drank 10 liters of wine a day. The ideal figure was probably just a dream. And Hermes was, after all, a god.
The Eladonikis, the officials, saw to it that all rules concerning hygiene and competition were observed. At the start of the games, they and the athletes took an oath in front of an awe-inspiring statue of Zeus. But that didn't stop vanity, ambition and perjury triumphing at ancient Olympia, as the plinths that have survived in front of the stadium confirm. They once bore statues of Zeus paid for with fines. Opponents were paid to lose. Athletes offered inducements to switch allegiance, and officials paid off. It is truly amazing that no one is afraid of the god at Olympia. But by the time an indignant Pausanias expressed that criticism, the Olympic Games had already experienced a number of scandals. Under Roman rule, the sanctuary was plundered. Nero had the games moved to fit in with his appointments calendar. He crashed during a chariot race, but still had himself declared the winner. Under other Roman emperors, the games experienced an upswing. New buildings were erected and an irrigation system installed. And the masses continued to flock to the contests. But now they prayed to a different god. As tourists, they gazed in astonishment at the gold and ivory statue of Zeus. In AD 394, Theodosius banned the contests. History gradually buried the games. What remained visible was graciously covered over by the mud from the two rivers. Fragments of victors. Scraps of ideals lie scattered in the Olympic quarry. The work of the stonemasons will not restore the spirit of Alexander the Great to this circular temple. But it does give a feeling of the enduring quality of a magnificent history. In the early morning, perhaps, or in the evening, when the busloads of tourists have left and the watchmen no longer whistle, when the olive trees begin to whisper and the light of the setting sun draws a veil over this place, then the sense of a great past makes itself felt once again, imbuing ancient Olympia with a touch of sanctity. <laughs> 